Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering the importance of church on this year, Tuesday morning, Rise and Shine. And this morning here, we're looking at a topic, Change the Current of Your Thought. Change the Current of Your Thought, Our Thoughts. And this is what we're looking at here this morning as we do our live talk program. So, welcome again, top of the morning to you. Hopefully, the blessed night rest. And you're ready for this morning or this day. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank thee again for the blessings of your word and for the blessings, dear Lord, of the life that you give us. Pray that you may be with us, dear Lord, that as we um, look into these things, that they be before life and for health. May you bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. So we are looking at, at this topic, change the current of your thought and how to change the current of your thought. And um, so this is one of the important things to me of church is to change the current of your thought or the importance of what we do here on the radio or what um, just the preaching of the word or the studying of the word is to change the current of your thought so you can chew on something or some mental bread. So change the current of your thought so you can chew on some mental bread of life. I put in bracket there. So chew on some mental bread but um, it's the bread of life. <laughs> so this is what we want to do. I want to be able to change the current of our thoughts. You know, we can get to a place where we take um, ourselves, we take the problems of life, we take um, the gain for, you know, just the regular paying the bills or just the regular issues of life. And we can make them become so important and so engrossing that they control our thoughts and control our mode or mood the things we do from day to day but when we come to the word when we start to tap into what is spiritual it changes the current of our thought and it brings our minds somewhere else and onto other things that are of importance and the desire for the material the desire for the everyday issues of life becomes a lesson and they be put in the proper context and so we want to be able to change the current of our thoughts and so that we what we do this how we do this is by chewing on some mental bread of life when we chew on some of that it does something for our minds and so we begin here in the bible in john chapter 6 verse 32 john chapter 6 verse 32 through 35 and it says here, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Uh, so as you look at life, you think, what is happening in the world with all these various different, whether it be suicide bombers or people going up and shooting up um, malls or schools or where people taking drugs and just popping off, dying? On a regular basis, what's happening? And ultimately, you can go back to the source of the problem, which is people are do hunger and they're thirsting. And when that thirst and that hunger becomes so, so much that people lose hope, they lose um, what's the value of life, they lose focus on what is truly important. And instead of they giving their life to bless others, they decide that it's not worth living, while there's others that are in the need and could use their service. But yet they waste their life on themselves. And a person, the more we focus on ourselves and not others, then the more we um, lose what is the context of life. So Christ said, look, I came and I gave. And what I gave, I gave you life. Now somebody said, but how did Christ give life? His life was used as a service. 30 years he worked as a carpenter. Three and a half years of ministry. He worked to heal, teach, preach, feed. Um, do all the things that it can to bless humanity. And it is not just the life, physical life as a ransom, but it is what type of life. See, there's many people who die from day to day, but their life is not a value because they live their life to take out of life. They remove 
life and happiness from others. So Christ gave the life that was not just saying that this is just the Son of God, but he gave the life where he was given to each one of us. He was blessing um, or those who were living at that time. They receive the good word. They receive the what it is to live out that word. The word became flesh and dwell amongst us. And we saw the word for what it is. And we say, oh, that was what he was saying. Oh, that's what the Old Testament was all about. Because we saw the Old Testament walking and talking. And we see the true purpose of life. And so Christ says, he's that bread of life. And then when a person partake of him, not him in just hanging on the cross, but who exactly is that person that hang on the cross, you see the person no longer hunger. And so many people are looking to satisfy themselves with something. And no matter what they do, they're never satisfied. But he said, when you come to him, all of a sudden that satisfaction of life comes in. The person says, I'm good. I finally found what I've been looking for. And so he that believe shall never thirst. Person is thirsty. Person is going sea and land seeking out something. And they're trying to find it in all type of methods and ways. And they're still not satisfied. And so what to me what church does is change the current to a different way, so to speak, of satisfying the person. So the persons try material possession. They try fun and games. They try all these different things. And when you come to the Bible, the Bible change your thinking. And so there's something that is missing in your life. And when until that thing is satisfied and you see the value of that thing and you appreciate it, um, you'll never find satisfaction in all the other things. Now, the other things don't disappear. In other words, somebody could try to find satisfaction in eating, and eating become a sport, and they're still never satisfied. After a while, they can't be satisfied with three meals a day or two meals a day. Uh, it's just never stopping, and they lose control. A person could satisfy, try to satisfy life with sexual gratification, and the more never satisfied, they become weirder, and more out of control. So there's something else in life that unless that is satisfied, it is just we are hungry and thirsting. And so to me, when we go to church, when we study the Bible, when we do our devotions, what we're doing, we're satisfying that other part of life. And it's what I want to talk about here for the rest of the time with you here. And so that's why to me, the spiritual exercises change the current of our thought. So we chew on something that is simply mental bread or the mental bread of life and when we chew on that it satisfies us and it's just it's just i don't know if you're in a situation or you're just sitting and you just thought to pray you pray and it's just this feeling that comes over you that it it is not something that is material it's, it is just an emotional spiritual i don't know how to describe it and that is that satisfaction that one can get by just saying if i you know, eat some food or if I buy some new clothing, it doesn't satisfy in that way because it doesn't feed a certain aspect of our life. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 through 4, Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 through 4. So in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 through 4, uh, there is an imp another important facet of life other than the material, and that is the spiritual. So there's the material this is the world that we come up into we think you know clothing you know the on any material possession that we can accomplish again or hold on to or interact with even if we don't own it is what satisfy life but the bible teaches that there's more to life and when we start to think on those things is to start to fill a void in our life that we didn't even know per se exists we just knew that we were always thirsty or hungry now look at Deuteronomy 8, verse 2 through 4 with me, and it says here, And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God lead thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his, his commandments or not. So notice here, it is what was in thy heart. It, it, it is, a, as I say, religion is something of the heart. And it's a hard experience. Is where you are emotionally, where you are with your your affections and your desires and your love. So, in order for you to 
keep the commandment, one has to have a heart religion. It has to be something that you've grown to love. So that's why with material possession, it's always a heart experience. When one becomes so focused on it, it's, you love something, but the thing you're putting your love on never satisfy. You're never satisfied with it. The Bible says, he who loves silver or he who loves gold will never be satisfied with it. Because the more they get, the more they want. Because it doesn't satisfy. It's not a point where you say, okay, I'm good. Verse 3 says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thou, thou thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord that man live. So here, he showed them that say here, here's this bread. This is not something you're familiar with. So to me here, the bread, which is symbolic of Jesus Christ and what Christ brings, or the religious life, the true biblical religion. Uh, this bread here was something that they're not familiar with. And so it is to me with this with with the spiritual, you know, if you if I'm calling it exercise, there's probably a better term to use to describe it. You know, studying the word of God, um, learning about Jesus, so forth. You're you're partaking of something that you're not familiar with or really understand its mechanism. It is something of a miracle that when you do it, you get the result, but it's not something that is even easily explained. And so it is with this bread. And how the Lord taught them this was that the bread came, but it came of an, the source of it. It is not clear because it's false. So it's coming from the sky. So this bread here was something that was for it fell six days a week, not on Sabbath. So he also taught them the importance of the Sabbath. This is why I say when we go to church, we're going and we're keeping a seventh day. But we rest on that day. But again, the source of it is not fully explained itself because normally there's no th nothing to mark the seven-day cycle except keeping the Sabbath. So here you have the bread. They will, they, they're in the wilderness. There's no place for them to have bread or food. They can't go reap. And so this bread comes down miraculously. They partake of it and it sustains them. And it satisfies them. And it satisfies them. And even the bread normally would only last 24 hours. This is where it said, give us that this day, our daily bread. Because every day they had to receive a fresh serving of the bread. But the bread that came on Friday was double, was for two days. And that bread normally would last for two days. It wouldn't last for one day. So they would be able to eat half of it one day and then the other half the next day. Now would fall in Sabbath. So the Sabbath was separated as something unique. So the bread, although it was physical, was also teaching a spiritual lesson because it in itself was a merge of both things. And if you think about life, it's a merger of everything that Christ says. You know, later on, I'm going to read really shortly here. The next verse I'm going to read is that man should not live by bread alone. So the, Christ doesn't say man should live by the, the word only that God says. It's a by bread alone. That means the bread itself was miraculous, but also it was literally food. So we need food, but there's another aspect to life that is very important. And so when you think about the spiritual exercises, somebody would say, well, is the spiritual exercise is only spiritual or is, is, is it's only spiritual? Well, not really, because you still have to eat on Sabbath. As I said, the manna fell and they had food on Sabbath. But the focal point was to deal with the mind. And that's the important point there. The focal point was the retraining. So even here, because they were so into a carnal experience in Egypt, that Lord used food to try to retrain the mind. But yet the aim was not supposed to retrain the mind or focus on the food, but the focus was on the spiritual nature and what the what one receive, especially, I believe, on the Sabbath. Man should work six days a week, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Man physically rests, 
But yet you still have to eat. But you do all your physical preparation before you enter into the Sabbath so that the mind can be focused or the human being can focus on thoughts, the word, because the word is important. And so this is why I say we change the current of our thoughts by chewing on some bread, some bread of life. And when we do this, what it is, it just changes the way you think for a little bit. So you see that there's something that's important to life. Because life also is philosophy. Life is ideology. Life is information or what we call knowledge. Life is understanding. Life is wisdom. Life is not just the food I eat, the clothes I wear, the air I breathe. Life has a lot to do with the mind. And so he's saying here, mind should not live by physical bread alone, but my mental thoughts. This is what it had it is, because by every word, I'll read the text. Oh, but before I read the text, I'll read verse four of Deuteronomy eight. Notice verse four says, Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. So they were walking around in harsh condition, the foot didn't swell. The raiment didn't wax old. So again, to me, this is not something as a minor statement. It's a major statement because when you start having your mind change, a simple thing as not needing to buy clothes every season. You could buy clothes every season, but you don't have to change your wardrobe. I'm not saying <laughs> that you probably don't need something new for the summer. <laughs> I'm just saying this is your clothes. You start having clothing that you sort of look at and say, man, this, I had this clothes for how many years? Uh, it it becomes a, a how does it becomes a background thought. It's not the it's not the front of your thought. So it's not that you don't need material possession. It's just that that doesn't become the focus of your living. You don't see it as the the end of it all. You think about it. They were coming out of Egyptian bondage, the children of Israel, and the whole fact of the bondage was that Egypt wanted to not only maintain a dominance, but wanted to live luxuriously at the hurt and the pain and the suffering of the Hebrews. Because their focal point of life was a material possession. So they would kill and enslave anybody for that. It tells you where they were at. The Jew now had to learn that, or the Hebrew, under this teaching, that a focal point is not bread. Because most of the time what people do for bread is to rob, steal, kill, you know, kidnap, enslave, hurt their fellow human being. So in order for God to give us life, he has to change the current of our thinking. So we see that bread is not the focal point of life. There's other important things in life. And that most of the troubles that we have is because not so much bread, but because we have not fed the brain and we have not tapped into Jesus Christ, the true bread of life. Because when you live like him, he was a poor man that blessed many a poor man. But you go into a poor community and the poor man is so poor that he's trying to step on the head of even those who are poor to get out of his poverty. He would do anything even to hurt the poor man. But here Christ was at the bottom of the rung and he did not oppress his fellow human being, but blessed his fellow human being. So what was the difference? Why didn't he fight for money and for power and fame? Because he had a different ideology. And through his ideology, he being poor made many people rich. And that's the ideology that we have to take on. Man should not live by bread alone. But when we don't live by that bread, and we live for the bread, we will cause pain and hurt to others for our happiness. We will see others as a source of our pleasure and we will hurt them. And that's because we are feeding the wrong ideology or wrong bread. So that's why when you listen to the secular bread that they're giving out, it teaches you greed, show off, boast, so forth. So when we come to the Bible, we come to the truth, and we come to the church, we're just chomping on a different set of bread, a spiritual bread. And it gives us a different mode of thinking. Now look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, which is the text I was talking about. 
So this is the value of life. Um, uh, the value of life is not just in the physical. You see, the, my, the main value of life is in the spiritual. It's in what's going on in your head. And this is why you change the current of your thinking. Notice in 4, it says here, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So man should not live by bread alone. Now Christ doesn't say man should not live by bread, but he said bread alone. Bread, not just bread. So bread is not eliminated. As I say, after the Lord says, God taught us through the manner, he also says, your, your raiment wax not old. So the raiment lasts a little bit longer. Your foot did not swell because you weren't under the rigor. Because why were they out of the rigor before? They were the rigor before because they, they were have to be working so hard for bread. But when you realize, wait a minute, the focal point is not of life, it's not bread, or it's not material possession, then a person, you know, you and I know how many people who probably 10 years ago they could have retired. I live on the money. But they're burning the money so fast because they're spending so heavily as much as they can make because their focal point is I need more material possession and they're never satisfied. So, in the situation here that the Hebrews were in, they had learned that, oh, I don't have to work so hard. I don't have to grind so hard. I'm going to take it easy a little bit here. So the Lord gave them almost a month off of holy days. The Lord gave them one day a week where they do not work. They're forbidden to work. Imagine you go to a person and say, you don't have to work one day a week. And a person who's living for bread. And they think all life is about bread. They go berserk. They can be like, one day a week I should just devote to spiritual exercises, to going to church, to having devotion at night with my family. And just leave the world behind and not try to make bread. Or make, as I said, the donuts or the bagels or whatever. Um, imagine that. They'll be like, why? And I need to take more time off to spend with, go to retreats or go spend time with my family. Or whatever. They say, I could be making bread. I, I can't do that. I have to work until I die. Yeah, you keep working, but you don't have to grind away your foot and make it swell. Call yourself arthritis and diabetes and all that type of stuff. You can take some time for yourself and clean up your body and take care of your health. You can take one day a week off for spiritual exercises. But this is a different mindset. So people are rush, 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 because I have to take care of this, I have to take care of that. And the more they go hard, is the more they wear out their clothes, they wear out their body. In other words, this is what I understand that is simply saying. And the more you wear, the more you have to repair and replace. But when you take it easy, then you have less to repair, less to replace. And you are you have other thoughts that you're more conscious. So you see that there's more to life. And that there's other value to life. And all of a sudden, you start to realize that a lot of what you're working hard for, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's that you can spend more time on other things that are valuable. And that can be very cheaper, you know, when you spend all the time with your family doing simple family activities that cost no money per se. You find that all of a sudden your expenses reduce because your entertainment starts to become cheap. Now, what's your entertainment? Um, inter, you know, relating with others, relating with your family. And you have a very pleasant, happy, joyous, you know, over the top experience depending on the situation. And you'll be like, that was great. How much did we spend? Uh, just the same regular food that we have to spend. Money for food, just to live. So the raiment does not burn too much. So when you change the current of your thought by simply chewing on some bread of life, it changes the way you view the world and the way you react and interact with the world. Now if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 through 34, Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 through 34. Now other things that are of value, um, we think on. So there's, just just even you listen to me here, um, basically sharing with you something to chew on. 
basically. So bread of life, the true one. You think about that. And as you think about this, what it is is that whatever the world is throwing your way, that make you want to throw it and thinking this is the way to live. This is what life is all about. Now you listen to me here or you come and hear a sermon and I say throw on this. This is probably something as you need to. And I take, tur I'm turning the current of your life or your thinking into a different way, a different path. It's a different wavelength of thinking. And so you start to see life that, oh, there's something else to life. So notice there's other things that are of value. Um, and it's when we start to study the word of God, it readjusts our focus and it refocus our mind into um, what life is truly about. Notice the more, more person live a secular lifestyle, the more deeper they get into a secular lifestyle, the more they start to become disillusioned with what life is about. Because they're moving away from what, what life is about and they're moving into paths where the devil has made what life is about. And so we get to a point where we don't fret over what we know God knows we need. God knows you need these things. This is just part of life. You don't fret over it. Notice in verse 24 of Matthew 6, it says here, No man can serve two masters, right? And that's just the reality. It's always been the reality. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve both. You serve God, material possession is just what they are. God knows you need them. Notice here Christ I'm going to teach now. Listen to this. He says here in verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what you shall drink, nor what you uh, nor, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. So the body is more than, than raiment and the life is more than meat or food. So he says this is not the focal point of life. It, it, it is not that it's not important. Um, other way you can look at it is that you, you don't worry about it or fret over it. You don't get up and, oh man, I get anxious over these things. Because life is more than, it doesn't say that life has nothing to do with clothing and food. It's just more than this. You don't make major over minor things. Things like food and clothing, they're part of life, they're needs of life. But they're not something for you to get up every day and lose your brain over it. That's a simple life. Because again, when your thoughts change, your clothes last longer. Why? You're not thinking to change it as often. And you start thinking, well, probably I need to buy clothes that's going to last me longer. Probably I need to spend extra $10 and buy natural fabric clothes than buy all this polyester junk that I put on the market. And all of a sudden, your clothes start lasting you longer. And you start having a different mentality to how you even purchase things. You start of buy things with a long-term view in mind instead of short-term view. But you don't serve these things. They're just there. And you will see when, as I say, when your mind change, you'll see that it is there. It's important. But there's a person that will lose their brain over it. And you just like, it's there. Notice verse 26 says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought, or would could say why worry, or fret, why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not a ray like one of these, which is so true. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall ye not much more shall he not much more clothe you, or ye of little faith? So he's saying here, this is not something for you to get up and lose your mind over. You know, sad to say, we're living a day where um, you can get clothing for so cheap. Because of the mass production that goes on. That it tells you more and more. You don't have to worry about that type of stuff. Verse 32 says. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of 
these things. So th this is here where that thought comes in. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. So the person who does not believe in spirituality, does not see the value of, I just say, ideology, um, spirit, you know, spiritual exercises, uh, doctrine, biblical teaching, uh, you know, understanding, just see life as a round of getting stuff. This is the focal point of the Gentile. So he's saying, this is what the Gentiles seek. Your father knows you need this. This can't be the, own, the end of your life. And what makes it weird is that imagine if you're living your life, a very spiritual life, and you see other value in life, you have another important concept or facet of life that a person who is a Gentile just don't see. They don't have no, they don't see no value in it. So their life is very one dimensional. All they see. So the problem now is say, for instance, you have that material possession. You're not worrying about it, you just have it. You work, buy the sweat of your brow, you eat bread, you're eating bread. You're wearing clothes because you buy the sweat of your brow. You have it. You have what the Gentile have. And the Gentile going berserk over it. And you just have it. You notice it just it changes the formula. Because God said, don't fret over it. I know you need those things. I'll take care of it. You know, you just keep doing what I tell you to do. Bible says you work, you work. Bible says you live for, you know, to bless others. They're just living to bless themselves. So it changes the tenure of your life. Because now that Gentile, because that's all he seek. He now, if he can't have it, he said, man, I'm going to break the commandments to get it. He don't think about it like that. But he just say, I'm going to do these things. So he'll join up with other Gentiles and go create a war and go steal people's material possession. He'll do all kind of stuff so that he can gain that material possession because that's the focal point of his life. And that's what it all about. So... If you're driving a car, you look at that car, he will, he's willing to do anything to get because that's the focal point of his life. That's the whole aim of his life. He sees nothing else. Does have value. And if you now turn around and you see it you happen, know, I'm going to take all my money and I'm not going to just put it in material position. I'm going to put some of it in helping the poor, preaching the gospel, you know, taking care of those who are oppressed. They look at it and say, why would you do that? If I had that money, I'll take that money and I'll go drive a new and more expensive car, I'll buy new and more expensive clothing, I'll buy a bigger house, I'll do this, I'll do that, because that's the focal point of life. They don't see no value in it. Other than that, the the time where they could spend with their family, they'll be like, well, yeah, I want to spend some time with my family, but it has to be with big money, because that's the only focal point of life, just to gather their children around or their family around and just sit and enjoy a good time together. It's not a focal so Christ says, look, that's all the Gentiles seek after because that's their mindset. That's where they're at. Can't even help themselves because that's all they see what life is value. So verse 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So Christ said, you're still going to get them because remember, man should not live by bread alone. So bread is included, but that's not the only focal point of life. It's not bread alone. There's more to life than just simply bread. So God, God says, you follow me, you'll have these things. Because part of following Christ is the same. It's to labor. It's to work. You put your work in something. Whatever you're doing. Whatever the Bible says, whatever your hands find to do. So normally I say, what you have in your hand? What hobby? What skill? What talent? Whatever you're given, God given. And somebody said, That's all, this is all I have in my hand. What you find to do it, do it with all your might. We mean do it with all might. Do it until you sweat. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Whatever that is. That's whatever part God has let you down and this is what you're doing. Well, you do that, but just do it with more effort. So somebody said, well, what if my talent is to paint? Well, just start painting with all your might. Paint out to your sweat, if that's possible. And then when you do that, and you do that with all your might, and you go find, wow, somebody will be like, I like the painting you're doing. Could I pay you to do this? I have some paintings I need, blah, blah. And so you know, you're making money with that painting, and that's all laborers. Just whatever you find, fine to do. Just do it. Just do it until you sweat. And just do it until you're tired, until you just, man, I'm yawning. I'm exhausted. Bam, that's that's your labor right there. And you just do that. Wherever you found yourself to do, if, if, if it's in landscaping, if it's in you know, some medical world, if it's in whatever, just do it until you sweat. 
until you're tired. And if you keep doing that day, six days a week, and if you can do it five days a week, do it until you sweat. And that's what you do. And when you start doing it like that, you're in the right path. And so God said, that then you're going to have those things. Don't worry about it. There's other things I want you to do. So he says, first, you learn to seek his kingdom, his righteousness. And you're doing something now where the Gentiles not do it. Verse uh, 34 says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow or the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Notice he's not talking about bread now. He's talking about the day's trouble. So when we talk about eating and chewing on some bread of life, it is simply just taking up your task for today and just do it. And just do it with all your might. And the troubles that you have, just face them today. If you can't face today's trouble, then it makes you better to face tomorrow's trouble. And what it does, it changes the current of your thoughts so you don't start to fret. Because if you're taking care of today, what happened 20 years from now, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. And normally what happened is that there's a person who is, say, coming up to retirement now. And they didn't face the work for today. They didn't face the troubles for today. So when tomorrow comes, they're not prepared. They were living for all the material possessions, so they probably made money. But because their thoughts were never changed, they never think about anything beyond the here and now, so to speak. It's like a duplicitous thinking. They end up burning for tomorrow. But sufficient is today. If you take care of what you need to take care of today, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. If you don't take care of what you need to take care of today, you're going to worry about tomorrow. And that's just how I look at it. A person that's living a Gentile life is not taking care of today. And so tomorrow is a mess. Hopefully you get that. See, today, are you supposed to exercise? Go ahead and exercise. Then you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Someone says, so should I worry about the sickness that's going to come on me when I'm 60? No, or 70? No, don't worry about that. All you have to do is worry about the exercise you need to do today. That's it. That's your challenge today. How about the way you're supposed to eat? Don't worry about what's going to happen when you're 90. Just worry about how you eat today. Sufficient is today, the, the evil thereof. It, it doesn't take away, per se, planning. But again, you can't be planned for what happened 20 years from now if you're not taking care of what's happening today. It's useless. Now, you can still plan, I guess. But again, if you, if, if, if you start to think about a plan, a plan is just basically executed today. What are you doing today? Somebody could say, oh, I want to do such and such in 20 years. Yeah, but what are you doing today? Uh, what do you mean what I'm doing today? Well, today is a step to get to that 20 years. What is it today? You take care of today. Whatever challenges, because often those challenges are tomorrow's solutions. So you face today's challenges. And when you face them, you face them in a different way. That's a simply a thought. Now, you hear me say that thought. Um, a day later, you might be, it might pop back into your head. And you might say, let me analyze what Lloyd was saying. So part of planning is I have to take care of today. <laughs> and you, you go chomp at that bit and then tell me what you come up with. Now, um, in Genesis 3, verse 4 through 7, we notice here that Adam and Eve failed, but they did not fail on a physicality, even though the physicality was a manifestation of the mental. They fail on the mental. And the moment they fail on the mental, the physical become into play. And so, if uh, God take care of the sparrow, sparrows, he will take care of you. So that's an important thought. God taking care of the sparrows, he take care of you. Look around you, everything is taking care of you. Good, don't worry. Can you see or have you ever seen a person who have so much and lose it all because they um, they have a rich person problem? Have you ever seen that? Normally, there's some people, there's some problem they call rich people problem. And normally some problem will happen with a person where they have so much that they start to have problems that a regular poor person does not have it. And then they start to lose stuff because they probably have too much money. They start to do things that are becoming, you know, you know, I'm talking about like the eccentric lifestyle, you know, the, the, the you know, more bun, money than brain, sorry, more money than brains lifestyle. So the person says, I have too much money and too little brain. And the next, you know, they have uh, too little money and no brain still. So we don't want to be like that. And this was, to me was Adam and Eve problem. They had more money than brains, it seems, or they lost their mind. You know, so you can have it all and lose it because the philosophy, the fight is not a physical fight. 
It's not the money in the bank or the material position one owns. But it is the mental fight. And when one loses that mental fight, the money, you have to watch it disappear. You always hear about these superstars and these people who are sport athletes and so forth. They're losing mentally. They're not losing physical because physically they're physically dominant. And so somebody say, I'll pay you to watch you play a sport. I'll pay you to watch you play with a ball. Because your physicality is so advanced that it's entertaining and interesting to watch. And some of it is literally interesting to watch. Just what somebody can do physical with their body. And if you try to do it, you realize how difficult what they're doing. And they can do it consistently night after night. And somebody say, I'll pay you to sit and watch you do that. And that's fascinating. But yet, the person not losing all that money because they're, you know, they, they, they're just simply losing it because they've lost on the mind game. So, what happened? It's That happened to me, to Adam and Eve. They had it all. They owned it all. They were, um, they were in life like a god. They were like God. They had lost the mental battle, end up losing the physical substance. See what they were being told. Oh, you know, I'm going to read in a second. You will be like God or as God. But the problem is, they were like God. They were like gods. They were as God. They were going to be the king of earth. They they really had it all. You think about what we read about Adam and Eve and the short description of what the Garden of Eden was in life before sin. And you think about where we are now. If they were living today and we were living in our state, we look at them as they're like gods. And that's what it is. But they traded being like gods to being what? To be losers. See, the mental battles, that's why when we study the Bible, it changes the current of our thoughts so that we can chew on some bread of life or we can get some life into our head. But it's the philosophy that changes. Let me read it. Genesis 3, verse 4 through 7 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God not know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's imagine. They were as gods. They were like God. They were created in the image of God. They were referred to in the New Testament as the Son of God. They were son, a son and a daughter of God, directly from the hand of God. God bred into them, breathed into them, and gave them life directly. They had communion with God. And they reflected, they were made in the image of God. So you look at them and their mannerism and behavior and possibility, some physicality, we don't know. They're like God. I was like, wow. And yet, <laughs> the devil says, you be as God. I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're tricking me. And this is the funny thing about it. You're tricking me into losing what I'm already am. Strange. And you're telling me that I'm going to get where I am at by telling me to disobey and ultimately I lose where I'm at. And that's a trick. So that's why I say you can see a person, the thought here in my mind most naturally is a person who have the thing, like say they have a lot of money. They go to somebody and the person tell them, I'll make you more money <laughs> and you're going to be phenomenally wealthy. And the person was already phenomenally wealthy. And the person gave the person the money and the person tricked them out of their money so that they become broke. But they tricked them into offering them what they already were. And you'd be like, that's crazy. Because the person is being tricked into getting what they already have. You rich. And the person said, I'm going to make you even richer. And, but you already have more. Why do you want more? The money you have, you can, you can think about some of these type of money that people inherit or gain or win or whatever, that they'll never be able to spend it for the rest of their life and they end up losing it. <laughs> You'd be like, but if you were, you would never be able to spend it for the rest of your life. Well, how could you lose it? What's the point of losing it if you could not spend it for the rest of your life? But they got it. They had everything. They had the earth. They had the Garden of Eden. They had communion with God. What more? And the devil said, you can get more. And that's been a trick because often we're good. And the devil says, 
I'm going to trick you. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that the tree desired to be make one wise. And it wasn't going to make you wise, it was going to make you a fool. She took off the fruit thereof and did eat and, go, and gave it unto her husband with her and he did eat. And they eat, uh, sorry, and their eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed so fig leaves together and made themselves an apron because now you have to start faking it because now you've lost the true riches. So you start to act rich. And so God wants now to change the current of her thought. Because remember now, the current of their thought was all gone wrong. It was all going over the bridge now. Gone over the bridge. And so the word comes in. And the word of life comes in. And we start to chew on that bread of life. To change the current of our thought back to the right place. Because where they were going, sin and more sin was going to come in. She believed. And because she believed. She didn't believe in the Son of God. Whatever the Son of God had told her, she disbelieved and she believed the devil. And the end result was she was going to go to debt. Now Jesus came later on and through the word and through the prophets and said, this is the word, believe in this word. And we have a struggle with this all the time because deception tells a person, no, go with the way the devil say. Truth come and said, no, go with the way God says. And here we're now, Christ knows that it's a heart religion. So let's try Christ dying on the cross so we can love God's way. That's, that to me is how I see it. It's just because we have two options. God's way or the devil's way. Christ comes and he shows that, look, I really love you. And if he can get us to love him enough, we'll say, okay, we'll go God's way. He can steal our heart away from the devil. The devil now tricked Adam and Eve and he stole them away from God. But if we don't love God, we won't keep his commandments. It's just to see God and love him. So it's just to change that current. And if, we, you know, some way by preaching, teaching, by interacting, by trying to be kind to people, you can change the current for them to see that God is love. His saints are love. Then they might turn back to God and start keeping his commandments. In John chapter 8, verse 31 through 32, John chapter 8, verse 31 through 33, um, it read, Then said Jesus to the Jews, which believe on him, If thou continue in my word, then, ye, then are ye my disciples. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Right? So, when we notice here that a, no person, now remember, these are people who believe in Christ, and I'm sure some of them standing there didn't believe, but it says here that they that believed on him, he said to them, and probably others who heard that were not believers heard, and say, hey, we, we were never in bondage. So no man or woman is truly safe without truth. This is why we study the Bible and we say we want to know the truth. So if our thoughts are in captive to falsehood, we can never be safe. Because falsehood leads to false paths and to false conclusions. And so you can never be safe in error. So, to me, why church is so important is that we come in to church, we go to church, we study the Bible, you come here, you listen. Whatever we're doing, we're trying to find what is the truth. But often, finding what is the truth is a change. The moment we find that, it changes the current of our thinking on a subject. And it leads us away from falsehood and false paths, so we don't end up in false conclusion. So it doesn't matter what the status of a person is, whether they're rich or poor, free or bond, they're not safe in falsehood or in false paths of thinking or current of thinking, a stream of thinking. If you have a false philosophy, if you see why here, you know, if you listen, I would try to talk about things going on in society because things going on in society um, are, are, are really happening because people's way of thinking, not just what they're thinking, but their way of thinking. In other words, they have a calculation in their mind. 
And based upon that calculation, they come to a certain conclusion. And no matter what equation or situation you place in front of them, their calculation or the way of thinking is going to make them come to a certain conclusion. So to when you wrestle with the word, not just doctrine in the sense of this doctrine says this, this doctrine says that, but understand how you come to proper conclusions and why. And we wrestle with the word. And many people don't like to do this, but to me, Bible study is not cannot be question and answer, question and answer, and you always have a set answer. Because a person who have memorized all the set answer is really a robot and they're destined to fail. They're in bondage. Because they don't know how to work their brain. And the question always have to come to them the right way. But if you notice when the devil comes, he never brings falsehood with with a proper question and answer. Where it's just the right question, right answer. He always bring it in a new way. So if you don't know how to come to the conclusion by thinking, especially thinking yourself out of a paperback, then you're just trapped. And going to be in bondage because you can't think your way out. But some people believe that the way to overcome the devil is Bible memorization. I believe in that. You know, like a text that says the way your sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's Bible memorization. But you can memorize all the Bible and still trip up. Remember, the devil was right there next to Jesus Christ, next to the Father. Still trip up. Who knows the Bible more than him? He, he knows the word of God. He trembled at it, but he ain't repentant. So it's more than that. It's, it's not a formulaic, so to speak. It is something that you have to have knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Knowledge can be very formulaic. It's just information. But understanding is something that you gather from knowledge. Some people are stuck at a knowledge level. They never get beyond that to the understanding, much less to the wisdom. How to apply that teaching to life. And you know, so we go back to John again. So when you look at John, it simply says, the Jew says unto him, if you continue, he said unto the Jews who believe, if you continue your word, you are my disciple. And you shall ask the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Or you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the truth frees us. And when we, it's the current of our thoughts. It's the way the thought run down. You bring me a person who is having problems with doctrines. You bring me a person who is having problems with depression. You bring me a person who is having problems with their marriage. It's the way they think. You bring me a person with financial problems. It's the way they think. And sometimes it's not the right answer. You know, I could go to anybody and say, should you be debt free or should you live with the lowest amount of debt possible and so forth and so on. And they give it the right answer. But I say to them now, how do you make that happen? And now that's a current of thinking. It's how you think. Knowing the right answer, good. But you have to get to the next point now. How do I get out? How do I make it that I spend less and make more? How do I get it that I learn to do certain things to cut my costs? How do I learn to, as I say, buy clothes that have better material, cost more money? You know, it's a current of thinking. If you don't, you don't understand how covetousness plays a role in all that type of stuff. You don't understand how laziness and how lack of skills and all of that stuff. It's the current of thinking and so forth and so on. Uh, it, it, John chapter 8 verse 34. Let's see if we can quickly go to this here. John chapter 8 verse 34 and 35. So sin enslaves us because before sin comes... Before sin comes into our life, it, it, there's an ideology that comes before that causes the sin. This is why when we go to church, when we listen to sermons, when we study our Bible, what we the Lord is trying to do by the Spirit is change the current of our thinking. But that current comes with the ideology. And unbeknown to most of us, we have so much ideology in our head that is mind-boggling. We get ideologies from our parents. We get ideologies from sane in the world. We get ideologies from TV in various different forms of media. We, there's all kind of places we get ideology of principles to live by. You may be, hear somebody say, "I'm gonna do it because it's the it's the I'm gonna do it because of the principle of the thing." And normally it could be something bad they're gonna do, but it's gonna do it because of the right thing to do, like exacting revenge. And that person will constantly do that until you break that thought in their mind. 
I said, that's why we study the Bible. We go into topics that people will say, why are you studying that topic? Because I'm trying to break the thinking. Because I realize when I talk to different people, that as long as that ideology is enthroned on the heart, the person always will do wrong. They'll never stop doing wrong because the ideology is driving their actions. So sin enslaves us, but sin comes after the ideology. This is why Satan didn't get Adam and Eve to sin simply by just saying, hey, go sin. He gives them an ideology, and the moment they accept the ideology, the sin is done. What's the ideology? You're not only not going to die, you're going to get better. And by the accepting the ideology, all of a sudden now the fruit become desires so and they can walk over and pick it. But until the fruit became desires for food and one and something to make them wise, this is an ideology. They had a new ideology on the fruit. The fruit was bad to eat. The fruit before was in their mind something that will kill you and mess up your head. And it's the same thing. I always say this is like remarkable because to me when I read this, I always see it describing weed or drugs, marijuana, that type of thing. Why? Because the moment a person has an ideology that marijuana is good for you, they'll smoke it. The moment the person has an ideology that alcohol is good for you, they'll drink it. But if the ideology is that alcohol causes breast cancer, alcohol causes stomach cancer, or causes throat cancer, neck cancer, all these type of cancer, all of a sudden it's not food. If the person accept the ideology and now they're free. Now another person come along and say, wine is a marker and strong drink is a raging. That's good. That's a good answer. Beautiful answer because in it is another the bad ideology of wine. It is, it makes you mad and it deceives you and it destroys you. And it makes you an addict. So you take those and you apply them and you layer that. And you hear me here, I layer it, I layer it. Why am I doing that? Because I'm trying to break the ideology in the person's mind. So they don't see it as something positive and desirous. But as long as the person sees it as desirous, the person's action will always follow. And that's now they become enslaved, but they're not enslaved per se to the alcohol, they're enslaved to the ideology. And the, in their mind, they can't break the allergy, so they can't break the addiction. But the moment the person says, crack is bad for you, and you start to layer it in their mind, and you start to see it ruining their life, it's terrible. This is why so many people can't get off like marijuana, because they see it as something positively good. So in their mind, I'll never stop smoking weed. Why? Because the ideology it benefits me. It does something to me. But the moment you start seeing that this is a scourge and a terrible thing, it is start to move in a direction to break the ideology and Christ can work on the heart via the Holy Spirit. So notice here it says in John chapter 8 verse 34 and 35, it says, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin, and the servant abided not in the house forever, because the son abided forever. Most naturally, a person that is becoming violent, you don't want to live with that person. A person that's covetous, you're not going to live with that person. You might try to. You might love that person so much that you make all the effort, but after a while, they become out. So having some mental bread of life changes the current of the thinking to free us from sin. Remember, it was the current of Adam and Eve thinking. So they saw something that was definitely bad and they saw it as good, so they partake. So if your ideology is thinking, if you go to church and you're throwing the bread of life, if you wake up in the morning and you're throwing the bread of life, and you just chomp on it, that spiritual mental thought, what it is now, the more you study it, is the more you start to see drugs and alcohol, bad, not good. Sexual sins, bad, not good. Love for money, bad, not good. Covetousness, bad. Pride, bad. Theft, bad. Hate, whether hate comes in the form of causing someone to murder or to do violence or to be dishonest. Bad. If you hear me some morning fighting here and I'm talking against racism, somebody say, what is it? Are you trying to you know, irritate certain people? No, I'm not. I'm just trying to try to tell the person, like when you see me have a topic where I say racism doesn't work. Why? Because I'm fighting it on any front I can because I want to make a person have something to chomp on the chew on or probably I shouldn't be racist. And break the ideology. So now when they see a person who is of another group or tribe or tongue or people, they can love them as God's creation. And you break the ideology. Because if the ideas don't break it in your mind, 
your action is going to follow. You're going to do something and say something. And somebody's going to say, man, what's wrong with you? And they're not, never going to know because they don't understand it's deep in your thinking. Having other gods is bad. Being disobedient to parent, disobedient to authority, disobedient to leadership, it's bad. False ideology. You see a child that can't listen to their parents, they don't listen to nobody. I've been in church situation, I'm dealing with somebody and they're disobedient and they just can't hear, they, don't, they just disrespect people who are in leadership. And I realize that's what they do to their parents. It's been in their head, all that ideology is packed in their mad head and it's just there and they can't get it out. So normally sins start in the heart, but also the love of God starts in the heart. And so we go to church, we hear some sermon, we study the Bible, we listen to a sermon, you come and listen to me here. All we're trying to do is break that ideology so that we can have our mind goes in the right current as we chew on the bread of life and we start to gain some substance in our body or in our mind so our minds can free our bodies and our thoughts from sin. Let's pray. We thank the O God again for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, for the spirit that lead us into paths of righteousness. Pray, Lord, that you may break the bondage, break the chains, the mental slavery that we have in our heads, and that we might be free indeed in Jesus. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Form Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow morning where we should talk about natural health. Until then, I'm praying to make unto you walk with the King. Mm -hmm.